Hi everybody, we are in section 5.4, talking about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So, it took us all the way until the second to last section of the course, but we finally made it to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, the reason we call this the fundamental theorem is because it really um, is kind of that connecting theorem. It really brings together everything we've learned this semester, the concept of the derivative and the concept of the integral. These are the two main um, focuses of calculus, and they're brought together in this formula. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look. So the fundamental theorem has two parts to it. Um, so we're going to look at part one first. So suppose that f is a continuous function on the interval a, b. We can define a new function, g of x, equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt for each x in the interval a, b. So <clears throat> we're creating a new function here that is defined using an integral. Um, so recall that the definite integral of a function is a number. Uh, the variable x uh, gives the upper limit, so for each value of x, the definite integral will be a number. So as x changes, right, the number changes as well. Okay, so um, just like with any function, if I input 1 into a function, I get an output. If I input 2, I get a different output. If I input 3, I get a different output. Same thing here, except our inputs are going into an upper bound of an integral. Okay, and that's what we're using to create a function. All right. So in the case that the function is positive on the interval, then we can say that the function g of x, right, that integral from a to x, equals the area under the graph of f over the interval a to x, as shown in the diagram. So maybe on your page, hopefully it's a little bit clearer, but I know it's kind of kind of light here. So let me just fill that in. So there we've got our, our curve. Okay, with our with our area beneath it. Okay. So see as we let x change, right? So from a to x, we get this area in here. But if we let x change, we make x, you know, larger, then we get a larger corresponding area, and then etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. As we move x up, we start getting larger and larger areas, and that gives us different values for the function. So suppose f of t equals t, and find g of x, where this is the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt. So g of x equals, so this is the integral from 0 to x of t dt. So take the antiderivative, so that's t squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to x, okay, which gives us x squared over 2 uh, minus 0, right, 0 squared over 2, so really it's just x squared over 2. Okay, so, But that's our function. That's the function g of x as determined by the integral. So we can use this to now determine area under the curve Right, just by plugging in different values of x, and that will give us different areas right, over different intervals. Okay, so let's look at an example, another example, a little more graphical. So suppose f is the function whose graph is shown in the figure, and g of x equals the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt. Find the following values of g and sketch its graph. So let me try to fill this in a little more closely here. Oops. I can zoom in. There we go. Right, and so it goes somewhere like this. And again, it might it might be clearer on your page, but this is just kind of a rough sketch here. Okay. All right. So. We have our curve, and we want to find the corresponding values of g and sketch the graph. So when we're looking for 
uh, g of 0, g of 1, g of 2, 3, 4, and 5. So let's start off with g of 0. So the function g, again, is defined by this integral. So this is the integral from 0 to 0 of f of t dt. And the integral from a number to itself, that, that contains no area. So this is just going to be 0, okay, which, of course, that just gives us the point 0, 0. So that's going to be a point on the graph of g. And then when we're looking for g of 1, so this is the integral from 0 to 1 of f of t dt. So that means we're looking at this area in here, okay, from 0 to 1. And we're trying to, oops, we're trying to approximate this area as best we can, right? Because we don't have a specific function here, so we just need to do the best we can, try to get a close enough approximation. So just by my estimate, just by looking at this, I'm kind of picturing this as like a right triangle right there, and then there's our right angle with a height of 2 and a width of 1. All right, does everybody see that? So let me get rid of the triangle so we can see the graph again. So that's what I'm I'm picturing here is that triangle, so one-half base times height, um, which would be just 1. So we get g of 1 is 1. You might get something slightly different from that, but it shouldn't be too different, right? If you're getting a, a value of 2, 3, 4, or something higher, then, then that's a bit of an over overestimate by a long shot, okay? So then now, become, now begins kind of a recursive process here. So g of 2, this is the integral from 0 to 2 of f of t dt. And what we can do is we already know part of this integral, right? We know the piece of the integral that goes from 0 to 1 because we just found that in the part above here. So this is the integral from 0 to 1 plus the integral oops, from 1 to 2 of f of t dt. Okay. So this first value, this is just right, g of 1 plus the integral from 1 to 2 of f of t dt. Okay. g of 1 is 1, approximately. Plus, now we need to estimate the area of this one. So if we look, so I've got two, two full squares here right? that we're adding in. So that would be 1 by 1 squared. So that's 2 plus a little bit more up here. So I'm going to call that uh, 2.1. If you want to call it like 2.2, 2.3 even, you could do that. So I'm getting 3.1 for my value of g of 2. Okay. Then for g of 3, that's going to be integral 0 to 3 of f of t dt. And again, like I'm, I use the word recursive, um, that just means that this pattern is going to repeat itself. So, because this one we can just write as the integral from 0 to 2 f of t dt plus the integral from 2 to 3 of f of t dt. So, and again, just like in the previous one, the first value here we know, right? This one is the one we already found. So this is going to be approximately, oops, 3.1 plus, 
that area from two to three. So let's take a look at that. And I'm noticing that this area over here looks pretty similar to the other blue one over there, right? The one we found earlier. It might be a tad bit bigger, but that could also just be the way I drew it. Uh, but it still looks like, you know, I could approximate it with a triangle, like a right triangle there. So uh, I'm going to call that area uh, 1, just like we did for the last one. Uh, well, maybe we'll just do a tad bit bigger, right? Because I noticed this one, this one kind of cuts it off a little bit shorter than this one does. So let's just call it, uh, let's call it 1.1, just slightly, slightly bigger. So plus 1.1, so that would be 4.2 is our value of g of 3. Okay. Uh, and then for g of 4, so this one, again, integral from 0 to 4, so we can split this up, 0 to 3. Plus 3 to 4. All right, so that is g of 3 plus that new area. So this is approximately 4.2. And then the integral from 3 to 4, so that one is going to be down here. So this one is actually a negative area, right, because it's below the t-axis. And what is that value? Well, I would say it looks pretty close to this one, right, because, again, it's it has a little bit of a bigger bulge here, um, just like this one does. So I'm just going to call those the same area. Uh, but this one, of course, is negative. So we're going to have minus 1.1. So that would give us a value of 3.1. Okay. And then g of 5. Let's do that real quick over here. So g of 5, that's going to be right g of 4 plus integral from 4 to 5. Integral from 4 to 5 uh, looks about the same, right? I would say looks about negative 1.1. So that would be approximately 3.1 minus 1.1, which is 2. So we would get g of 5 is about 2. And then what we can do with these points now is we can use them to plot the graph of g. Okay, so, um, so keep an eye on these values because I'm going to scroll down here in this graph and make these bigger so we can visualize the points. But we have the values so 0, 0, And one one two comma three point one, so just a little bit above there, three comma four point two, so a little bit higher, uh four comma three point one, so that should be about the same as that one, and then five comma two right there. Okay. And then let's connect these as smoothly as we can. go. Alright, so that is a rough sketch of g of x. <clears throat> okay, so
Um, the way that we're kind of shifting our perspective here, uh, just like with the antiderivative, we're going backwards. Uh, whereas before, in the derivative sections and chapters, I would give you this graph, and I would say, you know, give me the graph of the derivative um, by looking at the slopes on this curve and then plotting it here. But now I'm giving you this graph and saying, well, let's take the antiderivative and let's work our way backwards uh, and use the area under the curve to find this graph, so the graph of g here. Okay. So here we have uh, kind of the formal statement of the fundamental theorem part one, um, and this is really just demonstrating that relationship between the derivative and the integral, the fact that they undo each other. Um, so if we have f is continuous and the function g is defined as we have been, so this is our function g, if that's also continuous and differentiable, then g prime, so g prime, which is the derivative of that integral, equals f. Okay, so this is just demonstrating to us if we take the derivative of an integral, we get back to the original function. Okay. So therefore we can say that g of x is an antiderivative <clears throat> for f of x. All right. So let's find the derivative of this function. This is called the Fresnel function, um, but we don't really need to know anything about that. We just need to look at what the function is doing. So here we have f, s of x equals the integral from 0 to x of sine of pi t squared over 2 dt. So s prime of x, that's going to be the derivative of, oops, of the integral from 0 to x of sine of pi t squared over 2 dt. Okay, and we take the derivative of the integral, and the derivative and the integral essentially undo each other, so we're left with sine of pi x squared over 2. And it is x, right, because we're using x for our evaluation here, not t. t is just kind of a placeholder variable for us. Okay. So let's look at another one. So we get the same same kind of thing here. So if we take the derivative of the function uh, given to us in an integral. Now one thing to notice here, whereas in the previous examples we were going from a constant up to x, in this case we're going up to x squared. So we need to be mindful of that and how that's going to impact the derivative. So let's leave the derivative out of this for just a second. So we take the derivative of the integral. So the integral is going to give us whatever the antiderivative of secant of t is. Okay, so let me just do kind of shorthand here. So antiderivative of secant of t evaluated from 1 to x squared. And then we're going to Okay, so we're going to take the derivative, and we're going to have antiderivative at x squared minus antiderivative at 1. Okay. So now what happens 
when I take the derivative of this part, the antiderivative at 1, that's just a number. Okay, so that derivative is just going to turn into 0. And that's kind of the whole idea here, is that whole second term goes away. And we're left with the derivative of this antiderivative. So the derivative and the antiderivative undo each other. So that leaves us with secant of x squared. However, when you take the derivative of this function, right, you have to apply the chain rule because that's an x squared in there, not just an x. So we're going to also multiply this by 2x. Okay, so if this had just been the derivative of the integral from 1 to x of secant of t dt, right? So let me, this different color. So if we had had the derivative of 1 to x of secant t dt, this would have just been secant of x, and then we'd be done. Okay, but we have to take into account that chain rule here. So the derivative and the antiderivative, the integral, still undo each other. So we still get this function here, our original function, but because of that inside piece being different, because of that chain rule, we do need to multiply by its derivative as well. Okay, so that's a slight, a slight variation on what we've been seeing so far, um, but that's pretty much all there is to that. So, okay. So now on to part two. So part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is the one that we use a lot. Um, so this is the one that allows us to evaluate integrals much more effectively and efficiently. Um, so we, uh, instead of doing rectangular approximations, instead of doing you know, estimates and getting area under the curve by uh, geometric means, we can use part two of the fundamental theorem. So suppose that little f is continuous and big F is an antiderivative of little f. Then the integral from a to b of little f of x dx equals big F of b minus big F of a. So bottom line, if we want to compute the integral of a function, get the area under a curve, we need to take an antiderivative and then plug it in, uh, plug in b, plug in a, and subtract. Okay, so get an antiderivative, plug in b, plug in a, subtract. And that's how we can get area under the curve. Right? Much more simply than having to do rectangular approximations or limits of Riemann sums. Okay, so uh, notationally, these are kind of the two ways you'll see it written. So this is our evaluation bar right here from A to B, or you could put it in brackets as well if you want to bracket the function. Um, so you can see even I'll write it both ways a lot of the time. So uh, this allows us to now compute antiderivatives um, in order to find integrals. So let's compute the integral from pi over 4 to pi of 2 sine of x dx. So we need to take the antiderivative, so the 2 is a constant multiple, so the 2 isn't going to do anything. And we need to take the antiderivative of sine of x. So we ask ourselves, okay, well, I had a function, I took its derivative, it gave me sine, what was that function? And the derivative um, of cosine is negative sine. So in order to get the positive sine, it needed to be a negative cosine. So we get the derivative of negative cosine of x is sine of x. So the antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine of x. Okay? And then this gets evaluated from pi over 4 to pi. So we get negative 2 cosine of pi minus negative 2 cosine of pi over 4. Okay. So again, you can see here this is f of b minus f of a. Alright, so we got our antiderivative, right, from a to b here. 
So now it's just a matter of evaluating the cosine function. So uh, cosine of pi is negative 1, so that's negative 2 times negative 1 minus negative 2 times cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So that's going to be 2 plus root 2. And that would be our exact value. And I never want decimal approximations for any of these. should always be exact answers. So let's try another one. So find the area under the graph of y equals 4x minus x squared between 0 and 3. Okay, so that's going from here to here. Okay, so this is the area that we're looking for. And using the methods we did before, we would split this up into a bunch of subintervals, uh, get a bunch of rectangles, and approximate that area. We don't have to do that anymore. So we can just set up, so area under the curve, so that's the integral from 0 to 3 of 4x minus x squared. Make that a little nicer. 4x minus x squared dx. And now we take an antiderivative. So we get antiderivative of 4x, that's 2x squared minus x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 3. Okay, so we need to find f of b minus f of a. So that's going to be 2 times 3 squared minus 3 cubed over 3 minus 2 times 0 squared minus 0 cubed over 3. And it is important um, to make sure that you do write out the second term here and be careful with your parentheses as well because if that negative needs to distribute to something, then um, we don't want to forget about that. Luckily, in this case, this whole second term is going to just be 0, but that won't always be the case. So we do need to check it and make sure you're careful with those parentheses. Um, so, But this gives us uh, 2 times 9 is 18, and then minus 27 over 3 is 9, and 18 minus 9 is, of course, 9. So that means the area under this curve from 0 to 3 is 9. Okay. So here's an interesting one. So what is wrong with the following calculation? So we have the integral from negative 1 to 3 of 1 over x squared dx equals x to the negative 1 over negative 1 from negative 1 to 3. Uh, so let's see, what do we do here? So we had our function... We took an antiderivative, right? So that's x to the negative 2. So we add 1, divide by that same number. So we get x to the negative 1 over negative 1. Okay, so that looks good. Evaluate from 1, from one to 3. So we get... Uh, this is the same thing as negative 1 over x. So we get negative one third minus one over uh, one over one, and then that gives us four thirds. Okay. So what's the issue here? Um, in this particular case. It looks like the calculation is giving us, let's see, so this is negative one-third minus one, so that should be negative four-thirds, according to this. So then... If this is negative 4 thirds, how does that line up with this graph? 
right? Because if we look, I'm going to show you guys on Desmos. The graph of 1 over x squared, as soon as this pulls up. So we have the graph of 1 over x squared, like this. So we're looking for this area under the curve from negative 1 up to 3. The problem is, and you might have noticed this in the function earlier, but as we're going from negative 1 up to 3, so from x equals negative 1 uh, up to oops, up to 3, actually let me rewrite this, um, so y center equal to 1 over x squared, from negative 1 to 3. There we go, and I'll make it bigger than, bigger than 0. There we go. So this is the area in question, right? From negative 1 to 3 under this curve. The problem with this is that this function actually does not exist at 0, right? If you check that, that gives you 1 over 0, which is undefined. So what happens is if we go up and up and up, you'll see that this area just keeps on growing and growing and growing and growing, and it just keeps going, and it never stops, okay? And we can go up there forever um, because this function has a vertical asymptote at 0, okay? So this is... Uh, x equals 0 is our our vertical asymptote here. So the problem with this calculation, and the reason we're getting a number that doesn't really make sense, is because we're not taking into account um, this undefined value in the function. Um, and so it's giving us something a little weird. So we do need to be careful when we are working with these functions to make sure that we're not hitting something like this, like undefined value that just keeps growing and growing forever. Um, we, <clears throat> you will encounter um, integrals like this um, later on as well. If you go into like Calc 2, um, you'll study how we can actually tackle integrals like this for these areas of undefined regions. Um, but that's not really within the scope of what we're doing here. So. Um, this is just to let you know that we just need to be mindful um, if a function is crossing over like an asymptote or something that doesn't exist. So, Okay, and then our last page here. Uh, so differentiation and integration as inverse processes. So I kind of already touched on this a bit. Um, but basically, we're just talking about part. So here's part one and part two of the fundamental theorem, right? So there's part one, taking the... Uh, the integral as a function here, and then part two, of course, taking an antiderivative here. What this fundamental theorem really does for us is it ties together the concept that derivatives and integrals are inverse processes. They undo each other. So part one tells us that if I take the derivative of an integral, then they undo each other, I get back my original function. Okay. Part two says if I take the integral or an antiderivative of a derivative, then I get back to a version of the original. All right, so not exactly, but we would get a, a form of it. Okay, so again, derivative of an integral gives me original. Integral of a derivative gives me original. Okay, so those are... Oops. So those are the main ideas uh, behind parts one and two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. All right, uh, so that's the end of section 5.4. We only have one section left, so...